In this episode of Everything Compliance, the inauguration issue, we take a look at issues relating to the new Biden administration. Jonathan Marks talks about the increase in fraud investigations that have come up during the coronavirus health crisis, including uh, PPP loans and PPE equipment. Jonathan Armstrong talks to us about what the Biden administration may mean for Brexit in terms of a trade deal and what it may mean for the U.S. and the U.K. special relationship, particularly considering the vitriol Boris Johnson directed against Biden during the election campaign. Matt Kelly considers Gary Gensler at the SEC, Rohit Chopra at the CFPB, and Michael Barr at the OCC and what that might mean for enforcement. Mike Volkoff takes a look at two of the top positions at the Department of Justice with nominees Merrick Garland and Lisa Monaco and what that will mean and how Merrick Garland will have to work very hard to fix a very broken Department of Justice that was eviscerated under the Trump administration. Rants and shout outs follow the commentary. Everyone, this is Tom Fox, and welcome to this recording and live streaming of Everything Compliance. Uh, we are going to talk about some of the issues that um, have arisen in the under the new administration. So, Matt Kelly, uh, what is on your mind about enforcement at the SEC and the CFPB? Well, yeah, Tom, I have a, a few observations about what is happening already. And uh, I'm even going to go off script and throw in a third agency that I'm looking at, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Uh, So first, let's talk about who's who. I'll start with the Securities and Exchange Commission. President Biden's nominee to run the SEC is Gary Gensler. Uh, Those of you who might think that name sounds familiar, that is because Gensler, first off, he ran the transition for the SEC for Joe Biden between the election and now. And also Gary Gensler was chairman of the Commodities and Futures Exchange uh, Trading Commission back in the first half of the Obama administration. Uh, fun fact, if Gary Gensler gets nominee, uh, gets confirmed and serves as SEC chair, he will be the first person to ever have been chair of both the CFTC and the SEC. Um, we've never seen that before. However, It remains to be seen if he actually is going to get confirmed. I keep a close eye on the political discussions on Twitter and on various news sites, and uh, there's some uncertainty around exactly how close Gensler's nomination might be. It could be one of those where it's a 50-50 tie, and then the vice president, uh, she will break the tie, 51-50, and then Gensler would take office. There are some people who are not entirely happy with him, probably on both sides of the political extremes. Uh, There are progressives who would want somebody even more aggressive over SEC enforcement and policy management than him. And there are plenty of Republicans who would not like him. Uh, Gensler did also at one point work at Goldman Sachs in his past. Uh, So like, look, the the progressives are never gonna like it if you have Goldman Sachs on your resume. On the other hand, as far as I know, I think it's almost a requirement that if you want to be a financial regulator, first off, you have to breathe oxygen and be a person, and then you have to work at Goldman Sachs at some point in your career. Seems like that's the way it goes. Um, I think that what would be interesting here is that Gensler, to my analysis, is he's like a policy person. There are different types of SEC chairs you might see. And he is not, say, an enforcement person. He's never been a federal prosecutor. He's never been a state attorney general or anything like that. So Gensler would be the sort of chairman you'd want to have if you have some big policy plans that you want to enact, either coming from Congress, which may or may not happen, uh, but potentially could because Democrats now run the SEC. Uh, Or is it going to be new rules that the SEC itself puts forward? And that's where I would be curious. And I think that compliance people might want to keep an eye on what's happening. Let's say the SEC adopts a new framework for climate change, for diversity and inclusion, for ESG generally. That's going to be a big 
deal. That's going to be a thicket of stuff that they're going to have to take an interesting idea and put it into actual rules. Somebody with Gensler's experience, because he was so heavily involved in implementing the Dodd-Frank Act 10 years ago, that's the sort of experience you would need now. And look, he's the one that Biden is putting forward. Um, as a side note, you might also uh, see Gensler act around cryptocurrencies, which I hate talking about crypto stuff. I don't like cryptocurrencies. I don't know why they exist. Nonetheless, they are a big deal. And um, cryptocurrencies and fintech firms, when are they broker dealers? When are they tech firms? When are they banks? When are they all five or three or whatever it is that fintechs claim to be doing to renovate and revolutionize the world? Um, that's the sort of thing that also you might see a new SEC chair they're going to have to address. Gensler would be somebody who is much better suited to addressing it than, say, a federal prosecutor who's just going to drop the hammer on enforcement. Um, if Gensler wants to drop the hammer on enforcement, all he has to do is hire a really aggressive uh, corp, fin or corp enforcement director, and uh, he could still do that. So my nerdy question about Gensler is, is actually about internal controls. How will the SEC enforcement program under Gensler, or really under any new SEC chair, how are they going to take the internal control provisions under the FCPA and apply them to other non-FCPA things? Um, we've seen that provision being been applied for accounting fraud many, many times. Lately, we have seen it applied in some other interesting cases around insider stock sales, around um, untimely disclosure of a goodwill impairment when the company sat on it for a long time. And how did the SEC nail that company? They charged them on a uh, internal controls rule of violation under the FCPA statute. So that's weird, but I don't necessarily know that it'll, but you know, we're pushing the bounds of SEC enforcement thanks to that internal control provision. How would we see a new chairman do that, whether it's Gensler or anybody else? That's something else I'm looking at. Um, Next, Tom, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Office of the Control of the Currency because we have more action there. Um, the nominee right now is Michael Barr. And who is he? He used to run uh, Dodd-Frank Development and Implementation at the Treasury Department back in 09, 10, 11. So he actually helped implement and develop Dodd-Frank before they pass, passed the legislation. Now he's up for running the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Is he going to get confirmed? Again, that's unclear. Progressives actually don't think that Barr is up to their tastes and their speed. I still, if you play the politics of this out, I don't get what that means. So progressives would torpedo Michael Barr as being too centrist. And then what? We nominate somebody more progressive who's just going to get voted down because the Republicans are 50-50 in the Senate. I don't like that makes no sense to me. So I actually think that Michael Barr is still going to be in a good position here. Um, what would he actually do? I would look for him to talk about um, much more diversity and inclusion and equal treatment uh, of consumers in retail banking and how to hold retail banks feet to the fire for greater diversity and inclusion in their customer offerings and their disclosures and their business practices and all of that stuff. Um, again, that is something that Biden could do on the executive branch side, and it aligns very neatly with the progressives' uh, interests in the legislative branch, because that is what Congress and the House Financial Services Committee, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at racial uh, equity in financial services. They're looking at diversity and inclusion. They're looking at problems with systemic racism in financial services since the cows came home back way, way back when. So anytime you see a regulatory priority and a legislative priority that are pretty much overlapping on the Venn diagram, that's where the regulator, I think, would act. That's where Michael Barr could act. Uh, and then, Tom, your last one on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau the nominee there is Rohit Chopra. Is he going to get nominated? Unclear, but he could. Who is he? He had, until very recently, been a Democratic commissioner on the Federal Trade Commission, where he was pretty outspoken about more accountability for companies when they had violated 
discussion of data security practices and data collection and whatnot. Um, but back in the day, Chopra ran the student loan division for the CFPB when it had just started. Um, so what would he actually do for enforcement? I have to admit, I'm not paying attention to CFPB enforcement issues all that much right now, but clearly he'd have a much bigger appetite for enforcement than anybody in the Trump administration, which kind of just wanted the CFPB to up and vanish. Um, that's not going to happen. Uh, also, I would be remiss if I didn't point out Gary Gensler helped the Dodd-Frank Act get started. Michael Barr helped the Dodd-Frank Act get started. Um, Rohit Chopra ran the CFPB student loan division back when Dodd-Frank was getting started. And who was the one person who was instrumental in Dodd-Frank and getting it off the ground and getting the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau up and running? Elizabeth Warren. Her fingerprints are all over the resumes of all three people I just spoke about. Uh, so I would look to see what is she saying about these men and what their enforcement priorities would be. And you also have to look at Chuck Schumer, A, because he is the majority leader and he gets to a huge amount of say in nominees, but B, he's from New York. And a big part of his constituency is Wall Street, who probably doesn't like anything that these guys are talking about, but he knows that, and I think Wall Street knows, more is coming. So where would those two very influential Senate Democrats come down on all three of these people and what their agendas are? That's going to be very telling, too. Um, and then you want to say, oh, yeah, more enforcement. Yeah, sure. Of course, these are Democrats, of course, they're going to be more enforcement. Of course, corporations aren't going to like it, but that's kind of a given. And I think that's where we are right now. Jonathan Marks, do you have a question for Matt? Yeah, Matt, we all know that I think it's under Section 13B2A of the of the Exchange Act that requires public companies to keep and maintain, you know, books and records and accounts in reasonable detail. I know you talked about internal controls. You know, it's kind of interesting if you look at the if you look at the sort of his, history of how things came to be. You had the FCPA, which came into existence in 1977, which one can argue was really the forerunner for a lot of the legislation that has come to pass. For example. Um, you know, Fiducia 112 under the banking rules and regs. Um, and then you have Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002. And so, you know, while nobody, you know, everyone sort of talks about internal controls, you know, it's kind of interesting that even this year, if you looked at, and last year, if you look at the books and records violations of companies, I think they go hand in glove. So while I agree with you that they're looking to apply this in, um, it, you know, in, in other areas, I think what you're going to see, I think what we're going to see here from an enforcement perspective is that corporations are going to get pounded on the books and records side. And that, you know, sort of a sort of a combination with that, they're going to see things that they get in trouble for internal controls as well. And, you know, one of the things I'm going to talk about today, what that really looks like, especially under the environment, you know, COVID-19 environment and then the risks associated with that. So, you know, I agree with you. I think they're going to continue to, to pound on internal controls. You know, um, and I just want to get your thoughts on, you know, from an internal control perspective. I mean, where do you see this sort of going? I already sort of tipped my hand a little bit and told you about the books and records and 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 internal controls in, in combination. But I wanted to get your thoughts there as well. Well, you know, what sticks out to my mind lately is just this week, uh, a new report came out about a large survey of CFOs and internal control professionals about where they get guidance on good internal controls and what are they struggling with. And other than the COSO framework, which they look at, they have real struggles trying to figure out how can we define what is effective internal control. And they have deep suspicions that the auditors are hassling them over documentation and everything else not because they have weak internal control, but because the auditors don't want their PCAOB inspectors to come and hassle them. So they're just giving companies a hard time because the more we give you a hard time, the more we cover our rear ends with our own regulator. But there isn't really any good management guidance on what constitutes effective internal control. Like the last guidance that came out from the SEC was in 2007, and like, that's not fit for purpose anymore. So could we see some fresh guidance for management on internal controls? I mean, look, probably not. That would be nice. 
Um, but without that thing that executives and companies can point to to say, no, see, my controls are effective because you said I had to do this and I did it. We, we don't have that. And without that, companies are really kind of caught on the back foot when these enforcement issues boil up. And uh, I don't know when that's going to change. Yeah, I, I, I don't either. And that's why, I mean, in, in, a, in, in the general accounting world, that's why they're called general accounting principles. You know, and there's a lot of areas within GAAP that there are from a from a principles based perspective, either they're discussed loosely or not at all. And especially yeah. with internal controls, I agree with you. I mean, there, you know, other than COSO and maybe some other guidance that's out there, it, it's 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 sort of up to interpretation. And you know, one one person's interpretation, you know, as you can imagine, is completely different than another. And um, until we get some framework or some guidance there, or at least some more definitive guidance, I should say, I think it's really going to be um, it's really going to be a free for all, so to speak. Yeah. Jonathan Armstrong, do you have a comment for us? Yeah, I've got um, I, I'm I'm just interested in the cybersecurity piece because certainly what one of the reasons Chopra was sort of on my radar is if I remember correctly, he released a dissenting opinion in the Zoom he settlement. Did. Uh, effectively saying that Zoom hadn't done enough on cybersecurity. We've heard that the Biden administration have already said that cybersecurity is a day one priority. We in, in Europe, we're expanding the NIST directive to increase the obligations or to widen the definition of criminal uh, critical national infrastructure to make people take more care, particularly against attacks from nation states. Um, you know, UK financial regulators have reminded financial services organizations of their cyber resilience responsibilities. Is the chopper appointment part of the same trend? Is this Biden showing that cyber security is an absolute priority? I mean, I personally think clearly it is a priority, but a priority for whom exactly? And what's the you know, what's the firing squad offense and who gets to pull the trigger? That's really it. Like cybersecurity is a big deal, but cybersecurity breaches typically don't result in a financial restatement where the SEC is going to sue you. Um, they can they can certainly lead to operational disruption. So you have to pay attention to them. But is that really something regulators care about that you were too dumb and you got locked out of your customer data? Um They'd like to say that it's I still think that businesses and regulators struggle to identify like what is the legal infraction that is so terrible? The operational infractions are up to here. The national security inf implications are off the, the charts. But like, I don't know exactly who's going to be taking lead on this. And if Chopper was going to do it, I think he would have stayed at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, so. I don't know. Are you going to have the CFPB enforce uh, breach disclosure and uh, data integrity is cybersecurity breaches? That's, I mean, I suppose you could, but I don't know that that's their job. I don't know whose job it is to freak out over cybersecurity in, in like a regulatory enforcement way. Uh, I don't know. I struggle with this. Jonathan Armstrong, uh, sadly reporting the news that the Churchill bust has yet again been removed from the Oval Office. What do you think the Biden administration might portend for Brexit and your beloved Prime Minister Bojo? Yeah, beloved isn't the word I'd use uh, personally about Bojo, but I think as far as what you might call the special relationship is concerned between the UK and the US, then I'd hope that there isn't a substantial change. I'd hope that things actually in the ordinary course of events would get better. I mean, the UK and the US are still uh, great collaborators on a military level, for example. You know, there are six bit major military bases still left in the UK, 24,000 US military personnel on, on UK soil as we speak. We have joint operations. You know, the UK has new carriers, but relies on the US to land planes on them. So I think there's a there's a sort of symbiotic relationship in terms of military operations. And then I think uh, politically, in terms of things like the UN, then there have been shared agendas, you know, concerns over 
uh, China, over the uh, Uyghur Muslims, for example, and oftentimes uh, the UK has found its best ally in the US and, and vice versa. That didn't necessarily translate into a love or a widespread love of Donald Trump. You know, you, you, you only need look at the uh, statements from um, uh, from the Scottish administration when it was uh, thought that Mr. Trump was going to come and have an uh, inauguration day round at his golf course to know that he's um, not necessarily as welcome a visitor as some of his pre predecessors uh, like Clinton might be, for example. Uh, but I think that the political uh, status quo is uh, Im important in some respects. And I think that, um, you know, we've got the G7 summit coming up in Cornwall in June. There are bound to be uh, issues, I think, in terms of things like coming out of the pandemic, in terms of security, uh, where there's a, 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 an identity of interest. And I think climate change is very much on the agenda of the Biden administration, where it wasn't on the agenda of the Trump administration. And it's possibly one of the things that the Johnson administration is doing okay on. You know, the... Uh, I don't know what the what the official term is for um, for the prime minister's concubine, I guess we call her, but the the uh, the mother of Boris's latest child feels very passionate about uh, uh, climate change and the environment, and I think that's reflected in in, in Boris's views on the topic. Um, as far as Boris is concerned, then spoiler alert: I'm not. Uh, I'm not the chairman of his fan club. Um, he clearly does have a love for the U.S. He's born in the U.S., you know, like Springsteen. He was born in the USA. He's lived in New York. He's lived in D.C. in his formative years, in so far as he was formed and not created. And he uh, he's lived in Connecticut. Um, but I think that some perceive him as being far too close to Trump and almost like a Trump mini-me at times. There was obviously the um, the sort of e episodes with Nigel Farage and Trump, which were uh, untasteful, I think, unless you're a fan of the, um, I don't know, the, the Jerry Springer form of politics uh, with Farage appearing on the campaign trail even only recently and obviously there are close connections between um, between Boris and Farage and and I think Biden in the past has uh, has hit upon this connection I, I understand he called Bojo a physical and emotional clone of Trump so there's an element of personal animosity I think there my hope is that Biden's a, a big enough man to rise above that and to see the bigger picture that we've out that I've outlined about military cooperation and uh, and the G7 coming up imminently and I'm hoping that we um, that we see uh, a, a pragmatic view of the relationship between the US and the UK in, uh, as a result I think Biden will be closer to Europe and Europe as a whole, uh, not just the EU. I think that uh, there were some welcome announcements, for example, on Privacy Shield, where, again, that seemed to be a day one priority, and he looks to have appointed somebody good to try and lead that rather than somebody who's trying to, uh, you know, a baseball bat the EU into submission because that isn't a strategy that's going to work. But I think from a UK-US point of view, the jury's out. Uh, you know, um, uh, Bojo had one of his uh, lieutenants brief the press on his love for Biden. Whether he can persuade Biden that that's genuine remains to be seen, I think. Jonathan, in terms of uh, trade agreements or anything else that might come out of Brexit, do you see 
uh, movement forward on that, number one. And number two, you spoke about many of the uh, other uh, relationships or intertwining relationships between the U.S. and U.K. Would, will the same also continue with a serious fraud office, in your opinion? Yeah, I think I think in terms of agency to agency relationships, I would hope that they s- sort of, you know, carry on m- much as they have in the past. You know, as we've said before, the current director of the SFO uh, is American. She will know people in the um, in the in the new regime almost certainly. So I think the agency to agency uh, cooperation should survive intact. Obviously, there is a question about a post-Brexit trade deal between the UK and the US. And and, and, and Johnson will, will desperately want that. He will want the kudos of being the first trade deal of the Biden administration. I think the UK has probably done enough to deserve that, but I'm not sure that the Johnson government has. Jonathan Marks, the uh, lots of uh, fraud investigations have come out of uh, the COVID-19 economic response by the government. Uh, the FBI and DOJ have both ramped up investigations around PPP fraud and PPE fraud. What do you see in terms of uh, increased government investigations, whether it be led by uh, the FBI or the Department of Justice coming in from the prosecutorial angle? I think COVID-19 has really put um, a lot of companies on notice that fraud risk is is certainly increasing. Um, You know, with regards to things that we're seeing in practice, and I'll get to the regulators in a moment, but the things that we're seeing in practice related to fraud, um, you know, there's, there, there was a, a big pause as a result of the pandemic. And those, and, you know, those companies that, you know, had revenue targets or have compensation tied to revenue targets, those are the ones that should be really looking at those and understanding what their fraud risks are. Um, you know, take out your fraud risk assessment right now and take a look at those, all those risks. And I guarantee you some of them some of the risks that you have on there have emerged and some of them have just appeared as a result of the pandemic. Um, you know, fundamentally, when we start looking at sort of the breakdowns here and some of the areas where I think the regulators are really going to pound home on, and we've already seen some of this, you know, the SEC's already come out and talked about disclosure, um, you know, uh, with regards to COVID-19 and things that are going on there. But I think you're going to start to see a real focus on you know revenue recognition you know um you know re- earnings manipulation uh I, you know if i were somebody out there poking around if either internal audit or compliance you know uh, again compensation structures related to these particular individuals that have the ability to you know to, to change earnings um and their benefits associated with that any account any any general ledger account that involves estimation or judgment allowance for doubtful accounts, bad debt reserves, you know, all the accruals, everything, anything like that where there's earnings manipulation, I think it's going to be pretty large. I think the regulators are smart to this. We've already been through this before. Um, you know, I, I think that playbook is, has already been written. Um, you know, I think they've fired some warning shots across the bow related to this. Um, you know, from a disclosure perspective, I think they're going to hammer home on those particular things too. Um you know, but I, I really do see the SEC and the DOJ, you know, really focusing in on this. And I think, you know, we've seen, you know, FCPA kind of chug along and and we've seen a lot of prosecutions related to FCPA. I, I think there's going to be a big uptick with that as well. Um, so, you know, overall, you know, from an overall fraud perspective, you know, I really do believe that, you know, organizations really do need to start to take a look at their fraud risks uh, from a governance perspective, you know, disclosure committees, be on guard, you know, make sure things are properly disclosed. I mean, ask good questions before those things get released out into the world. But, um, you know, there, there is a propensity to, to show good earnings for various and sundry reasons, whether it's to meet debt covenants, meet consensus, you know, meet all kinds of other expectations. And so, um, you know, uh, 
th those are the types of things that you really should be uh, focused in on. And I, you know, I, again, you know, there was a there was a study that was done that said fraud was up twenty one percent as a result of COVID nineteen, and the anticipation is that it'll go up to fifty one percent within the next twelve months. So, um, you know, I, I I I do think this is something that is going to keep us all busy for a long time. I do think this bodes well with, you know, the evaluation of corporate compliance programs and making sure that, you know, compliance is, is being done appropriately and that the whole governance risk and compliance process is something that boards are taking a more active role on. We know now, um, and we, we've known for some time, the the pressure now that's and the emphasis, the, the emphasis placed on boards, not only to manage their um you know, manage themselves from an oversight perspective, but also to be looking at the compliance program more closely. You know, we have Bluebell that really, you know, and Caremark that have really come come into full circle there. And you know, I, I also think now with the passage of the um, the the Transparency Act or the AMLA, the Anti Money Laundering Act, I also think that again there's going to be some more pressure, you know, placed on organizations. And, and I do think the regulators have about had it with companies that have these compliance programs that are just not even uh, not even one click above ad hoc. You know, I do think the whole concept of uh, being more business intelligent is going to come into play, the use of data and things of that nature. And, and again, using COVID-19 as an excuse for not doing something or not following proper protocols, you know, as, as you've all, as everyone on this on this panel has talked about before with the document, 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 you know, sort of mantra, you know, if you don't have a good reason for overriding those things and you don't have, uh, um, you know, a, a policy or, or, or some type of mechanism in place to monitor those particular circumventions or overrides of internal controls, I think companies and institutions alike are in big trouble. Matt, do you have a comment for Jonathan? Well, yeah, just uh, one thing that sticks out to me as we're talking about SEC enforcement. Uh, let's not forget that last fall we saw a bunch of SEC enforcement actions around earnings manip manipulation based yep. on the SEC's own data analytics EPS team. Like They have a data analytics team specifically looking at uh, earnings per share manipulation and we've already also seen over in the healthcare world, the healthcare regulators have been doing data analytics to figure out False Claims Act enforcement for a long time. Justice Department told us last year all about compliance, getting access to the data it needs. And for all of this enforcement that we are talking about, like the need for good data analytics is breathing right down your neck. And more and more agencies that are making that point clear. No, that, that, and that's and that's really, really. Uh, those are really great addition and great points to to what I've just said. You know, one of the things that uh, you know we continue to do is, you know, we built the data analytics wireframe just because of that. We know that organizations need to be, you know, more business intelligent. And you know, the worst thing that can ever happen is that the regulators use your own data to find something wrong, you know, with your organization. But you know, that all being said, some of the I wanted to. You know, Tom had asked me to kind of point out some of the key areas that we see. So I made a little bit of a list here. You know, cyber fraud, you know, continues to, I see an uptick in cyber fraud, phishing schemes for sure, um, fraud by vendors and sellers. So again, you know, fund fundamentally, you know, your vendor master file, great time to use data analytics and review things in there. Great time to look at and match payments with, with vendors and things of that nature as part of your third party program. Payment fraud, you know, again, sort of goes a little bit of hand in glove, you know, with the vendors. Um, Matt, you talked about healthcare fraud. You know, there's identity theft, insurance fraud. There's been even some discussions recently around, you know, loan and bank fraud, specifically related to PPP. You know, again, I see bribery and corruption. I see a real big uptick there. You know, the pressure that are placed on employees, you know, because their earnings have been diminished as a result. Uh, you know, and some have had a windfall, but, you know, a lot of the organizations out there, you know, the employees are struggling and, you know, so employee embezzlement, no surprise, probably going up or has gone up already. And one of the things that we talked about early on in my discussion today was financial statement fraud. Um, you know, and, and again, I, I, wanted, I want the audience to really focus in on this. It's not only the numbers, it's the disclosures as well. And I think, again, that's one of the things that the SEC you know, there was a shot across the bow with that. And again, as Matt pointed out, you know, you have to be 
smart today when you look at your statements and those people on the board and those people on the audit committee, you know, you should be running or have some type of, of review related to, you know, your earnings and those particular areas that do involve judgment and estimates because it, it, it's, it, you know, at some point the board is going to get hammered and I'm just waiting for that to happen. Mike Volkoff, uh, Merrick Garland, a name well known to uh, many in the legal community, has been designated at, or uh, nominated to be attorney general. And Lisa Monaco has also been nominated. What do you see uh, in their role in repairing the damage to the Department of Justice? And where do you see the, the DOJ going forward in a variety of enforcement areas? Well, uh, as somebody said uh, recently, uh all general counsels should start looking at their legal budgets uh, at this point. And uh, because I think we're buckle up because Merrick Garland is uh, somebody I've worked with for, for many years ago, just a terrific person. And I think he's going to do a great job in restoring the morale at DOJ, which is going to take a while. Lisa Monaco uh, is somebody who is tough as nails. Uh, and again, these are two very experienced people with, you know, longtime prosecutors with a lot of commitment to DOJ. I mean, just a Merrick Garland, even while he was on the bench every year would come to the DOJ holiday party, the only judge to do so. Why? Because he loves the department of justice and he believes in the department of justice. And I can't think of a better person just uh, knowledge-wise, temperament-wise, and with integrity to have as the leader of the Department of Justice. I mean, let alone the symbolism of having him go through the confirmation proceeding that he was denied many years ago uh, and the importance of that message, but I can't think of a better person uh, to be the leader. That being said, uh, Lisa Monaco is, comes from the same ilk. I mean, there's a reason she turned down other job offers within the administration to be the deputy attorney general, which is, by the way, a great job where uh, probably, you know, very powerful in terms of day-to-day -day casework uh, and approving certain uh, types of indictments and settlements. So, uh, look, this is going to be great. It's going to be a restoration of the, the professionalism of the Department of Justice. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I can go through some of the priority areas and what I expect to happen. But we're, they'll also, uh, I think, defer a lot to their division uh, heads, the AAGs for each division, environmental division, criminal division, antitrust division. So we have to look at those people that are ultimately selected because priorities may be moved around a little bit depending upon uh, who that person is um, because they'll defer to them or give them some flexibility to set their own mark uh, on that. So watch who gets the criminal division chief job. Uh, and particularly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the environmental uh, uh, division as well. Um, so what would you expect first from the Department of Justice? Well, there are a couple things. Uh, first off, you're not going to have any communications, interference, discussions coming from the White House. Uh, we're going to go back to the traditional relationship between the Department of Justice, which is it's an independent agency. Uh, so everybody's saying, uh, I was reading, people were saying, well, what do you think Biden's going to do about the Hunter Biden investigation? Uh, I can tell you very clearly what he's going to do. Nothing. He's going to watch it and he's going to hope and, you know, that his son does all right. Um, the other thing to recognize is that, you know, they will probably, once Merrick is uh, uh, confirmed, you'll see all 94 U.S. attorneys asked to resign immediately. Uh, and then interim people will be put in place. Um, the U.S. attorneys' uh, selections are also very important, particularly the Southern District of New York, as we know. But uh, given uh, sort of uh, a lot of the activity that's going on, there will be other places that will be, I think, very important. But aside from putting in place people who are professional, prof besides sort of turning the morale around, I can tell you every line prosecutor there is happier as soon as they saw this, they became their job became that much better, twice as good. And hopefully some of the good people will stay and not go out to private practice. Um, 
But what are we going to see in terms of priorities? Well, first, let's talk about the civil rights uh, division. And you're going to see a much more aggressive uh, approach as a priority uh, towards civil rights issues, particularly the supervision of police departments, pattern and practice cases. I believe the, uh, the stats I saw was uh, the Biden, admin, I mean, the Obama administration had 12 or so. Uh, ongoing uh, at any one time, I think, and uh, under uh, Trump, there was one. Uh, that's going to change quickly. Police departments are quickly going to become, uh, and there'll be civil enforcement, there'll be criminal enforcement as well. Uh, in terms of environmental crimes, that's where I think we're going to see a major uptick. Uh, environmental crimes is a huge area, and we should watch to see who the environmental division chief is, but they're basically going to be told, go out and enforce the laws criminally. Uh, the, the Trump administration did some cases. Uh, don't ever forget that, the, you know, Carnival uh, and all its brands, uh, you know, is under monitorship right now because of environmental crimes. And you can imagine um, uh, some of the other companies that may fall under that. So that will mean a big deal. Uh, FCPA, our favorite area to talk about. I think that most of this is is uh, set in stone, but there are some. Uh, there's so many things that are sort of just continued. Uh, you know, keep in mind we had two record years under the Trump administration, uh, but the two years below that were the Obama administration, and I think we may see an uptick. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is the division that's occurred where sort of the big cases are handled by DOJ and the smaller cases by the SEC. And we used to see DOJ get more involved in some of the quote unquote smaller cases. When I say smaller, I mean like 75 million or, you know, in that area. Uh, I, do, I expect uh, that division probably to continue just because of workload. Uh, I do know that the FCPA unit is hiring, they got two more attorney slots uh, to uh, increase their, uh, their workload. Um, but here's a couple of things about the FCPA enforcement. Number one is last year we had no monitors. And it's too bad Jay's not with us today because uh, Jay should be doubling his budget uh, because I think there's going to be uh, more corporate monitors um, and I think the, uh, for example, in the last year, uh, I think uh, Obama had a set, the Obama administration had seven monitors in one year, uh, one of their enforcement years. So I think we're going to see more of that. And I wish we could reopen uh, the Goldman Sachs case and put a five-year monitor uh, huh. in there as opposed to a three-year. It's, re it's just absolutely ludicrous that the Goldman Sachs case did not have a corporate monitor, considering the rampant misconduct uh, and ignorance of the issue and blatant ignorance, people could say willful blindness uh, with regard to the uh, 1MDB scandal and the recordings that they got. They had recordings of senior officials basically blowing it off. And that is just, uh, it still makes me angry. And actually, uh, I hate to say, uh, you know, Gary Gensler and some of the others are all, they're all former Goldman Sachs people. Yeah. And if there's anybody that probably knows where the dead bodies are are buried, it's going to be Gary Gensler, uh, who was a Goldman Sachs person. But anyways, going back to the FCPA, um, so I think we're going to see more monitors. Um, I do think um, I'm uh, the uh, individual criminal prosecutions has increased each year. 28 in 2018, thir uh, 34 in 2019, 2020, without having grand juries or pros you know, or courts opening, they still had 22 individuals prosecuted. So I think this year we're going to see at least 44 to 50. I mean, that's my prediction, and I think it's going to ramp up. The other sophisticated part that the FCPA unit is really developing well if uh, it's pretty good to watch, is their ability to build cases now from within uh, by flipping executives or uh, flipping individuals. And they've been doing that. For example, we had Sergeant Marine. 
was a case that was built completely through bringing the individuals in and flipping them. Uh, and these guys, they're getting much better and better at FCPA uh, cases. And I think um, we're going to see more of that. So uh, to me, uh, that's going to be an interesting thing. One thing for Jonathan Armstrong is we also have heard some complaints from the Brits, our friends overseas, uh, some of the staff level, uh, what I've heard is that there have been some uh, complaints from the staff level that the U.S. Uh, prosecutors are not aggressive enough and that they don't take as much risk. Now, that may be because they didn't give the SFO as much money as they wanted in, let's say, uh, you know, the uh, some of the settlements that have come up. Mm -hmm. You know, but I thought it was interesting. This is, you know, I've always heard that the Brits and the U.S. prosecutors got along so well. Well, now they're calling us wimps. And you know how uh, when the Brits call the U.S. wimps, uh, the U.S., uh, we'll see how they react. But it's interesting. And I think, uh, and it may be because your head of the SFO being a U.S. person knows full well where they're drawing the line and whether or not it's a good line or not. And I think that the uh, so that's the first wrinkle I've ever heard of yeah. between you know the Brits and the U.S. I don't know, Jonathan, if you've ever heard anything about that. I think they're unhappy over um, uh, Una Oil, is it? And some of the there's a perception that there was some war over who was going to charge whom and where. So maybe it's a fallout from that. Um, I think we've looked at that in in, in previous uh, uh, discussions like this, and I, being neutral about it, I think the UK authorities are are not beyond criticism there either. So I'm I'm not sure if it's a fallout there. Um, I think there is a perception that the UK SFO in cases like Una Oil has been prepared to go for the man and not the corporation. So maybe it stems from that and a perception that the U.S. will quite often do a deal with the corporation and not take action against the individuals involved. So I'd be speculating, but 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 maybe that's the rationale behind it. Well, that makes sense to me because we haven't seen the Una Oil sort of, um, you know, we haven't seen that come out here in terms of unit oil uh, repercussions in the oil industry yet. We, I know that there are various companies dealing with it and dealing with investigations caused by the unit oil. And it may be that they're convincing DOJ not to bring case, certain cases or not to, to do things. And the, and the uh, SFO is saying, hey, come on, let's go. And uh, the, the, they're dragging their heels. That makes total sense to me. And that, that may be the good explanation. Well, let me let me just uh, wrap up quickly with uh, there are two well three issues where I think we'll see big up upticks and I trust I think uh, we'll see more civil enforcement. I think the criminal investigations against chicken processors will continue. The interesting question to me will be uh, Google uh, and Facebook, and I uh, I I don't think uh, this this administration is going to be one to pull the plug on those types of cases. It was only, uh, just to show my age, the Reagan administration that pulled the plug on IBM years and years ago. So I think those antitrust cases will continue. The criminal cases will continue. Where I think we're going to see a big, 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 big bump is False Claims Act. Uh, you know, the, the Trump administration put out, wow, they got a recovery this year total of $2 billion. Uh, I hope you realize that under Tony West, when he was uh, the head of uh, the False Claims Act prosecution sections and, you know, all of that as the number three at the DOJ, uh, the Biden, uh, the Obama, and I notice I call it the Biden administration, the Obama administration from years ago, eight billion. Okay, eight billion was their record. So False Claims Act, uh, if you're a healthcare company or you're a company, a defense company, uh, and especially healthcare folks, uh, you know, your compliance program consists of continuous audits. 
uh, and usually by Baker Tilly, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> given Jonathan's room back there looks so beautiful. So, um, <laughs> you know, I it's Baker Tilly and it's continuous auditing, auditing and auditing. And that's all you can do in the healthcare field when you're dealing with Medicare and Medicaid. My last point to everybody, which cuts across every issue, is compliance. Well, this is going to be compliance. Uh, I mean, we, we always say, I didn't say at the beginning of the Trump administration, watch out compliance officers. You better have your resources in place. You better have your autonomy and you better have authority within the organization. But if there's any time that's going to be required, it's going to be within the next uh, four years. Uh, one thing about when you put in really professional, terrific people who are empowered in the Justice Department, uh, those types of issues, uh, they will be able to see through in about five nanoseconds a paper program versus a real program. And, uh, you know, there, the, if I were sitting on a compliance budget, I'd be looking at increasing it by a minimum of 50%. Uh, and I would start thinking about instituting real-time, continuous procedures for risk assessments, for monitoring, for testing and auditing. Again, go to the Baker Tilly firm so Jonathan uh, can keep busy. Uh, but compliance is going to be uh, the new be-all and end-all, all the way from the regulators. I mean, you know, look, you're the people that re, that uh, Matt reviewed. I mean, these people are all serious pros prosecutors and regulators, and we're going to see just a ramp up. And you know, at CFPB, uh, I, I if you're a payday lender, you're basically under investigation. Uh, I mean, that's the way it's going to happen. That's the first place they'll turn to are the, the schemes and the techniques. And you may see criminal prosecutions as well that, uh, that, that, that prey on the underprivileged and, and the, 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 uh, the lower income uh, populations. These are the people who are going to immediately have to get uh, their act together. Last but not least, uh, money laundering. Just to add to everybody's, uh, you know, the recent um, override of the president's veto of the then president, the former president's veto of the NDAA included a new whistleblower uh, bounty provision that increases the maximum bounty to mirror the SEC's uh, formula. It used to be 150,000, rarely used uh, in any cases, but we have a new whistleblower. But more importantly, we have increased penalties, we have increased resources, and a mandate that inevitably is going to lead to more prosecution for money laundering. So I think we'll see multiple HSBC type of cases uh, multiple cases in the banking industry with the cooperation of aggressive regulators from the OCC uh, and, and the Fed and everywhere else. So uh, hold on to your hats, folks. This is going to be a, a, a busy time uh, and a, a good time for lawyers, uh, a good time for consultants, and a good time, hopefully, for commentators like uh, all of us because it's going to be an interesting time. Matt Kelly, you have a comment? I do. Yeah, I have two items, Mike, just to, if you had any thoughts on them. Uh, number one about antitrust. I was uh, struck when I saw that just this week, some Republican senators wrote to the Biden administration uh, looking forward to working to antitrust issues such as, and issues, the only one they actually cited was breaking up the monopoly of big tech. And I wasn't quite clear if they were are still on their Section 230 kick, or there are plenty of legitimate reasons to think big tech is too uh, powerful and should be split up. But they had said that, and that struck me. But my question is more, I'm curious whether what Merrick Garland will do about investigating a former President Trump now that he's out of office. Um, he seems uniquely well qualified for a task like that because uh, Merrick Garland prosecuted former right-wing or right-wing terrorists back in the 90s. And as a former appellate judge, like, there's no way 
this mess is not going to become constantly quickly. And Garland is going to know his way around that. Um, and for everybody who says that's interesting, but it doesn't matter to me, the compliance officer, please remember 30% of America still thinks Donald Trump was the second coming of Christ and that it was a great idea to storm the Capitol. And they're going to see their dear leader hauled up on an indictment somewhere, somehow, some way. That's going to happen. That's going to ricochet around your workforce and your workplace. So I actually am very curious to see how Merrick Garland handles something as radioactive as this. Although I think he is the best man to have that sandwich served up on your plate. But, I mean, that's on his plate. Yeah, I uh, well, two comments. First, on breaking up the tech company, I agree. Uh, I think it's not Section 230 that they're going to focus on. They're going to focus on uh, the fact that Facebook was allowed to buy Instagram. Yeah. And, I mean, Instagram and then later WhatsApp. And Instagram, when you look at it now, you can see how important. And, the, and by the way, if you ever read the case complaint, you know, we always try to t teach our clients not to put things in email. Uh, not to write things in email. Well, thank you, Mark Zuckerberg. You have provided a casebook example of why we take your email, train you on email. He handed them the case in the emails. He basically said, we better buy these guys because we're, they're going to crush us. Uh, and it's better to buy than to innovate. Okay. Well, I mean, you can't think of a better uh, set of facts. Uh, so th I think those cases will continue. They're too strong. And they're too important. Uh, similarly, Google is too important a case. Um, but I do think uh, uh, you raise a really tricky issue, though. Um, uh, Merrick Garland, natural instinct, I will tell you, when he sees a crime, I've worked with him, he's going to say, let's prosecute this person. I mean, he's just good. That's his, gonna, his natural instinct is always do the right thing and prosecute this person. I think, though, Biden is the president. Our new president is trying not to focus as much on that, given all the other things that are on his plate. What I think will really drive it is what happens at the state level. Yeah. If the states prosecute him and the feds can wait to see what the result is or can stand back and say, we support this and we'll help you or whatever, you know, we, uh, we support the DA of Manhattan. And I, I saw that the DA from Manhattan was looking at one of the properties where I know Michael Cohen had said, had testified that they inflated the value of the property for purposes of securing a loan. And uh, so, and it was pretty blatant, as I recall, uh, the amount that they inflated it by. Very interesting case. Uh, so I think that they're going to wait for the states uh, I don't, uh, you know, this, uh, there's so much to prosecute in terms of potential violations uh, that I, I don't think they want to get lost in it or have that drown out the message of civil rights, environmental crime, and holding senior executives accountable. The one thing that Merrick Garland and everybody, and it'll be real, to me, one of the most interesting issues is the, Biden, the Obama administration was rightfully criticized for not going after executives in the financial industry. Rightfully so, when the 2000, 2008, 2009, and that has been a, that has been a stain on Eric Holder's leadership. Uh, and they did it, they failed to because they mismanaged the organizational uh, what had to be done organizationally. They didn't create a task force dedicated to it like Enron or things like that that make sure it gets done. Because when you put a group of prosecutors together, they're not going to come out and say, hey, we don't think anything should be done. They're going to find what should be done and do it. In this case, I think um, they are under a lot of pressure not to have a similar type of record. And Merrick Garland, of all people, he couldn't care if you're the CEO the deputy, whatever, or when you went to Harvard or Yale and whatnot, he doesn't care about that. That doesn't mean anything to him. Uh, what means something to him is, did you break the law? And I think he knows politically that this administration has to uh, make sure they don't fall into that trap. Um, and, uh, you know, frankly, it's a stain on the DOJ's record that they had to issue the Yates memorandum, in my view, because every prosecutor knows you work your way up to the top and you don't stop. So I think we're going to, if you're, a, if the boardroom and senior management, no more excuses anymore. 
uh, and no more willful blindness type of excuses. Those aren't uh, going to work anymore. But we'll see. Um, I think those are such important priorities that I think America is grateful for the state law and the state prosecutors, uh, that uh, there's plenty there to do with Trump. Uh, and who knows, uh, you know, uh, what I like is the D.C. attorney general who doesn't have authority to file certain cases in the District of Columbia saying he's going to prosecute Trump. Look, you know, uh, we all want to prosecute Trump, but, uh, you know, that's that's the interesting question. But um, I think, look, watch out. Uh, I think it's going to be a great time to be a prosecutor at the Department of Justice for the next four years. I uh, envy those people. And um, and I think you're going to see some really uh, interesting work uh, coming uh, coming out. And particularly, I think your point, Matt, about the you have professional regulators here. And so the coordination is going to improve even more so uh, between yes. regulators and DOJ. And these the, these people are all of like mind. And they the one thing about Democrats is, um, you know, they uh, they're not going to shy away from some of the big cases here. And I, I think America's that type of person. And since Ooh. Jay's not here yeah. with the film reference. Not the first Garland to lecture people on courage. <laughs> All the, yeah, or, uh, yeah, that's true. So uh, gentlemen, uh, we are now on to um, rants and shout outs. So we'll take uh, the same order with uh, starting with Matt Kelly. Yeah, so I have a rant about a series of job postings I have seen uh, on LinkedIn and hither and there online lately of compliance officer jobs, senior compliance officer jobs at large companies where the compliance officer still reports in to the general counsel. Uh, I will call out two specifically that I've seen within the last week or so, uh, one at Dow Chemical, one at Morningstar. Both of the descriptions are, they're really looking for somebody who is gonna run the compliance program globally and the compliance person then will report into the general counsel. And I have seen a steady stream of other jobs that are compliance oriented, but clearly cut the compliance person off of uh, access to the CEO or the board, unless they're gonna go through 19 different hoops. And one other one that I'll give you uh, an example of what I mean, a director of compliance, that was the title. They were clearly from the details of the job description, they were building the compliance program. They're gonna be running the compliance program and you would report into legal still. And then this is a direct quote. You would have the opportunity to brief senior management on compliance from time to time. You know, I, I also might have the opportunity to win a new car if I go on the price is right or something like that. But the way they phrase it just really made it sound like compliance was a second class citizen within the business. And there are a lot of companies out there that are doing this that really should know better by now. Um, I hope that this bad habit gets broken sometime soon because these postings are proliferating far too much and we need to knock that off. That is not a good way to treat compliance. Jonathan Armstrong, do you have a rant and or shout out for us? Well, I have a rant, I'm afraid. Um, I've been somewhat critical of our lockdown regulations previously, but the police are currently investigating a 400 person wedding from last night. Now, uh, this uh, apparently they rented a room in a school where the principal of the school had recently died of COVID, uh, didn't say what they were doing, blacked out all the windows and held w allegedly a 400 person wedding. Now, I've been unfortunate enough to go to two family funerals recently where you're limited to 30 people and people have been incredibly responsible you know, no wakes after the funeral, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's not too big a sacrifice to make to limit your wedding to an acceptable size or to hold it in a safer venue or to postpone it. And regrettably, I hope the first time there, they see their wedding photographs are in an evidence bag. Wow. Uh, Jonathan Marks. So um, 
I'll start with uh, where can we find the light in this never-ending shade? My shout-out goes to young Amanda Gorman, the poet laureate, who at the inauguration. Um, not only was I impressed with the overall poem, but I was just impressed by the individual. Uh, I think that young lady is remarkable. And the words that she put together on that particular day to me, you know, I was truly touched. And so um, kudos to you, Amanda. Really fantastic job. Mike Volkoff. Well, Jonathan uh, stole my sh uh, shout out. Uh, and I will say this, she is uh, amazing. I also thought the whole inauguration was uh, a day of peace. And uh, I thought it was done in a tasteful way. I thought the ceremony at the at the reflecting pool was fantastic, uh, just to remind everybody and and what symbolism and what a change to have the first sort of formal uh, remembrance be of uh, the four hundred thousand people who've died uh, this year. And it really is when when uh, uh, you you think about the individual ripples from each each death that occurred and i hate to be depressing here at this moment but each the impact it has on family and friends uh and how uh we had a group of people who were almost seemingly numb if not just uh liars about it and uh it's it's wonderful to have the concept of empathy the, uh, and the concept of uh standing in one another person's shoes and seeing issues from that standpoint. So it was a wonderful, it was, a, you know, uh, somebody said it was the first uh, night that they slept soundly in the, the last four years. I have a bittersweet shout out uh, because uh, I was informed today that Hank Aaron has passed away. Hank Aaron, in my opinion, along with Willie Mays, are the two greatest baseball players I've ever seen. For the longest time, I thought it was Willie Mays, but uh, Hank Aaron may have exceeded that. I still can vividly remember the night he hit 714 against the Atlanta Braves on NBC television. That uh, memory is really seared in my mind. But beyond being uh, what was then the greatest home run hitter, he was one of the classiest acts in baseball. He started in an era of segregation in the 1950s. He played, uh, went to two World Series with the Milwaukee then the Milwaukee Braves, he moved to Atlanta, where he became uh, the home run king. Uh, he was an ambassador for baseball par excellence, uh, just one great individual. We lost, uh, I think, eight Hall of Famers last year, uh, baseball Hall of Famers, and now we lose uh, one of the two or three greatest of all time. So I'm going to shout out to Hank Aaron when he was the home run king, and uh, he'll always be in my memory. 755, baby. <laughs> Gentlemen, it was a Thanks. great show. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody.